Welcome back. Today we're going to mill up an 8x8 white oak post and position the LVL crossbeam in the house. So if you watched the videos on the assembly of the subfloor, you know that we created some 8x8 posts to support the subfloor. And those were all pine, but now that we're upstairs, I want to use a nicer grade of wood. So we're going to be using the white oak that we have on this property uh, plentifully. Uh, we have quite a bit of it. And uh, it's a denser wood. It's got to be 50% heavier than the pine. Uh, and uh, a lot of literature says that these are really good for ex uh, exterior applications as well. So uh, you might use some of this wood for decking or things like that in the future, uh, but I'll have to investigate that a little bit more before I take that leap. The post I want to create is going to be an eight by eight and that's going to be about 11 feet, 8 inches tall. Right now, this sawmill is set up to take logs that are 12 and a half feet. So with a little bit of extra on each end so that I can square them once we're on site in the house, I'm going to want to get at least a 12-foot log out of this uh, or a column out of this uh, that I can take back and then dress up. I have a variety of logs to choose from. I probably have about 30 stacked behind the camera of different lengths. Most of them are 8 and 10 feet, but I do have probably a half a dozen that are 12 feet that I can choose from when creating these posts. The way I usually go about creating these posts is one, getting the log centered on the mill, obviously. I always like to have the flared end of the log at the back end and uh, the skinnier end of the log at the front blade end of the sawmill. Uh, that may just be a preference. Um, the other thing you want to do is we need to find the center of the log on both sides because one side is flared and the other side's a little skinnier, which is always a bit more true for the longer logs like this 12-foot log. That means it's going to be sitting at an angle on the mill, and you want to even that up because ultimately you want the column that you're creating to fully contain the heart of the tree. It's called boxing the heart. So you don't want the column offset on one side of that heart because it will have uh, tension that will tend to draw the column in one direction. If you box the heart and get the center of the tree through the center of the column, the, there's much less opportunity for tension to twist or warp the column as it continues to cure over time. In this case, the centers were off by about three inches, so I ended up lifting that narrower end about three inches above the mill and putting a shim under it so it was stable and then I can make my first cuts and then that will be a pretty flat cut with the growth of the tree. I'll do that again after I turn it on its second side uh, so that we continue to keep the centers in the middle but then after that I don't need to do it because those two first cuts will go down to the bottom of the mill side and will be the flat edge that we're working with for the remainder of the cuts on the other two sides. I would like to take a second to recognize that as of this morning we have 500 subscribers to the channel so I just want to say that I appreciate you taking the time to follow and look at what we're trying to do here. Please subscribe if you're interested. I don't typically solicit subscriptions in these videos uh, and that's mostly because I like to think if people enjoy what they're watching they'll subscribe um, so you know on these many milestones uh, I may sometimes mention it but generally speaking I want to focus more on the content and if you are new uh, it's probably worth pointing out that these are not how-to videos for the most part I will talk a little bit about what I'm doing and maybe what I might recommend for a certain thing but for the most part I want to focus on the process and decisions around the things that I'm doing and decisions that I have to make and little problems that I run into uh, in hopes that it might help other people. But it's also just a way for me to document our little adventure. So thank you and always feel free to submit comments and questions if you have them. Now that we have the column cut, the next thing is to start working on the cross beam that will run through the center of the house. These are 20 foot LVLs. They're one and three quarter by 11 and seven eighths. Uh, because they're 20 foot and my forks only spread about four and a half or five feet, they're, they teeter a little bit when I'm moving them with a the tractor. But they are also lighter than standard lumber, so they're a little bit easier to move around on your own. Because the walls are gonna continue to get taller as we move to the back side of the house, I need to get an extra set of scaffolding. I call this Baker scaffolding. It's this yellow scaffolding that you can stack two or three high. It's pretty cheap, it's very strong, it's very light, and uh, it maneuvers around pretty easily. 
When you stack it this high, I'll also add some outriggers to one side of the scaffolding for just additional security. Uh, and you don't really need them on the other side because the other side is invariably against a wall. I believe these two sections will be able to do for me everything that I need. If I do need more, I can always build some temporary wooden scaffolding as well. Here I'm adding an outrigger to the top of this wall so that I can catch the LVLs as I put them up. The LVLs, we're going to use three of them. As I mentioned, they're one and three quarter inch in width. And we'll be since we'll be using three, that'll give us a five and a quarter inch beam by 11 and seven eighths. The span is about 18 feet, six inches. And this first LVL that I'm going to put up, I'm going to put up at its original 20 foot length because I want to get it in place outside of the space that I'm going to pocket it in just to make sure again that the beam is level and it's exactly where I want before I cut the columns that will support the beam on either end. And then the eight by eight white oak post that we cut will go right in the center. So the maximum span on these LVLs will be less than nine feet each. As I mentioned on a previous video, this wall, the short wall on this side is a little out of plumb and you can see me pulling it into plumb with this chain and ratchet. It's not far out, it was only about three quarters of an inch, but I wanted to make sure that both of these short load-bearing walls are perfectly plumb before I lock them into position with the LVLs. The LVLs will fully define that space moving forward. And so here you can see that 20-foot LVL is sitting across the space that it needs to go in, and the second LVL that I'm putting in, I've already cut to its proper length, so it will fit nicely into the pocket and the columns are just two by sixes laminated on either side. I've got four two by sixes that will carry each end of this LVL on this side. And again, the eight by eight white oak post will carry the LVL in the middle. The nicest thing about these LVLs, as you may know, is that they are very flat and they are very straight and they're also lighter than traditional lumber, as I mentioned. So uh, it, they're just very nice to work with and because you can get them in almost any length, it saves you from having to marry, and marry them up and splice them together like I did for the carrying beam in the basement. I think it's probably fair to say that raising these LVLs is certainly the most difficult thing I've done yet on my own on this project. They're heavy and they take some time and there's some precision involved and all those things combined require a lot of effort in order to get these in place. But it's certainly something that is doable with a little bit of planning and a little bit of muscle and just a little bit of determination. Now that the third beam is up, all of these LVLs are loose. They're just sitting in place and I will secure them with clamps just to make sure they don't fall. And I'm going to start working on this 20 footer to make sure that it gets where it needs to go. On the left hand side, I just created a place where I could slide it and so that it wouldn't fall out. And then I can flush one end and then I'm going to, rather than pull this LVL down to the ground, I'm going to cut it in place with the skill saw. This is one example where I do not like this rechargeable skill saw. It's got a safety switch on it that you have to depress in order for the trigger to work. And it just makes it very awkward in certain circumstances. You can do it, but I would much rather have a saw that did not have a trigger mechanism or a safety mechanism on the trigger. Uh, I may look to disable that. But now that all of these are in place, I can start securing the LVLs to one another and do the required fr framing around it. So it appears I built this house four inches too short to allow my scaffolding to make it through this passageway. So rather than take the whole thing down, I just kind of maneuver it uh, in a way to get it under that crossbeam. Hopefully I won't have to do that a lot. So in order to secure the LVLs, I'm doing a, a couple of things. Uh, the first, as you can see, is I, I'm putting a top plate over the LVL, and this top plate will run even with the second top plate, the double top plate of the two load-bearing walls on either side. This does a couple of things. It allows a consistent surface for the roof rafters, and because you are overlapping that double top plate across the load bearing wall and the LVL, it gives you an opportunity to make sure that there's a straight line between both load bearing walls and the LVL all the way across so that you have a uh, consistent measurement for the roof rafters from one wall to the next. That's where I'm at. Thanks for watching. See you next time.